It is so good to be in the frozen tundra. Uh, it's all relative, isn't it? It is so good to be here. It is always so good to see familiar faces. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name uh, is Doug. That's if I say something that you don't like. My name is Tony, if I say something that you do like, so you'll remember me, okay? Uh, but my name is Tony. I'm so excited to be here. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the entire world. Um, and uh, we've been married uh, for 26 years uh, next month. And uh, she, she still loves me, and um, I am fired up about that. I have three wonderful children. I have a 30-year-old son, I have a 24-year-old daughter, and a 21-year-old son. And uh, we're empty nesters and are enjoying it immensely, to say the least. <laughs> the title of my sermon this morning is simply entitled, The Greatest. I'll start off with uh, some questions to see if you guys know what's really going on in your city and what's going on perhaps in all of North America. Do you guys know which is the most popular restaurant what, what what which restaurant do you think is is has the most number in North America would you guess McDonald's, McDonald's. McDonald's. pretty good but wrong <laughs> McDonald's actually has the it's the third most in North America that's right okay let's have another guess Starbucks. Dunkin no not Dunkin Donuts mostly on the East Coast but uh, burger no no but the Starbucks, very good, but wrong. <laughs> Starbucks is number two. Actually, Tim Hortons. No, not, well, not in North America. Subway. Did you, did you say, did you say Subway? You, you, you guessed that. So there's about, there's about, oh, you know, in the U.S., there's about 25,000 subways. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's not a place that you can go and you will not find a subway. And you will say that has saturated, I mean, well, you can't open up another subway. You don't want, and certainly in combination with McDonald's, Starbucks, and Subway, that you can find one of those wherever you go. It's almost reached the level of saturation. And you may even say, we don't need another Starbucks, or we don't need another Subway. We certainly don't need another McDonald's. No. No. You add those up, you'll be around 50, 60,000 of them. Wow. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's, let's extrapolate and say, um, maybe all in North America, let's say 70, 75,000. You say, man, that's a lot. A lot. Do you know how many churches there are in, the, in North America? Whoa. Everything. Thousand. You said a thousand or thousands? Thousands. thousands. 190,000. So, 190, That's a nice guess, but wrong. <laughs> 350,000 churches. Wow. What's my point? If you do the math, that's about a thousand people per church. I'm here to tell you, we don't need another church in Ottawa. We don't. You think it's, there's 335,000 churches. We don't need another church. I put before you today it's not what we need. You want some religion? Turn on the television. Yes. There are, I don't know here in Ottawa, but you can find 15 to 20 television stations any time of the day. You turn it on and you'll find a television station. You want to know about books that are written about religion and God? Innumerable poems. Songs that are sung, we sung a lot of them this morning. Tapping my toes, snapping my fingers, sounding absolutely horrific, me. 
Nathan was stand, sitting beside me, and I saw that he was moving as I was sitting. <laughs> I was a little offended, but it's okay, it's all right. And so the point remains that it's not another church. I put before you today, there's so much information available. Man, you can become an expert on anything. Just Google it. <laughs> that serious? The world's library is literally at your fingertips. It's not information gathering. It's not another church that we need. I put before you what we need are Jesuses. Yes. And unfortunately, they're not always the same thing. And I believe that the most indelible mark that Jesus left on earth is the way he loved I want to talk about that this morning. For those who are visiting, I've been brought in because uh, I'm being, I think, interviewed. <laughs> and uh, I really find that uncomfortable because in that, I got to tell you how great I art, right? Um, and so I'm not interested in that at all. Um, but I, I, I really want to leave some thoughts with you this morning that it's not another church. And if that's what we're trying to, to do here, I think it's the wrong purpose. I think it's the wrong focus. But that we think about who we need to become, and that is, is to love like Jesus. And you might think, man, I come to church and somebody talks about love. It perhaps is the safest topic to talk about. But once again, I think it's perhaps the most dangerous topic if we were to love like Jesus. Because Jesus, his love was anything but safe. He risked his reputation, his status in society, yes, even his life. And it made me ask this question. Do I love like that where my reputation is at risk? Where my status in society is at risk? That even at times the way that I love, that I put my life at risk by the way I love? Does my love for others cost me anything? Or is it a matter of convenience? And if we want to play church, listen, there are many of them of all shapes, kinds, sizes, temperature. Because <laughs> it's a little warm in here, but that's another discussion for another time. I'm inspired and challenged by the way Jesus loved. The way he loved even Peter. From the time he saw him, he called him a rock. But he was far from a rock. Even you study his character. He started to rebuke Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to wash his feet. He cut off the servant's ear. He told the Lord, I'm going to lay down my life for you and denied him three times. I'm not talking about our love for God or even the love of God. Those are unbelievable topics. But the one that I'm going to focus on here today, the love for one another. Jesus made some ridiculous statements about love. This is what he says in 1 John chapter 2. It says, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his sister or brother, is not the best Christian. No, that's not what it says, right? It says he's a liar. As a matter of fact, he goes further and he says this. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. That is a statement that rocks our world if we really believe it. Can we say that we love God whom we've not seen and yet not love our brother and sister? Not possible. That's what scripture says.
But you don't know what she's done to me. You're dead right about that. But I think God knows and he still calls us. Jesus says in 1 John, uh, the scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, a new command I give you, love one another. Uh, sorry, in John 13, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says, you know how people are going to know that we're true disciples? It's by the wonderful song service that we have. <laughs> I did an exercise recently. I actually visited another fellowship. I went in. The songs were the exact ones that we sung. The people looked just like me. Well, nobody looks like me. But that's a frightening thought. Uh, it was a gathering that there were old people. And I said, man. There are a lot of places like this. Mm -hmm. They look just like us. But Jesus says, that's, that's not, it's not even by great exegesis when you're preaching. It's not even the right doctrine, even though I think that's important. He says, the way that we're going to tell whether or not we stand out, <coughs> if we want to form another congregation. No, it's how we love God one another. Yeah. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 it says this, for in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision carries any weight. The only thing that matters is faith working itself through love. Wait, the only thing that matters? There's 66 books in the Bible. 1189 chapters and it's summed up that the only thing that matters is it whether or not we have three song service and we have communion then we have to have contribution after that because it seems to be a convenient time to do it and and we have an opening prayer and we have a closing prayer and how many songs are we supposed to sing that's that's not what it says and so I want to provoke your thought this morning and ask us, what path are we on? What are we trying to do? And if it's simply just to have another church that somebody can come to, I think it's the wrong focus. Mm. Jesus crossed barriers. You looked at the woman at the well. Jesus was a rule breaker. He did. When he did things, his, his disciples scratched their heads after being even with him for a long time. What are you doing, Jesus? <coughs> Do you not know who this person is? Let me give you some examples. The Syrophoenician woman. She came up to him and and, and she, she said, please give me the crumbs of your table. And the people were shooing her away. <coughs> and he, she said, he, Jesus told her, I've only come to the lost sheep of Israel. And she said, hey, just give me the crumbs. Jesus went and he healed people on the Sabbath. He was going to show his love. And he broke the rules over and over and over again. I think sometimes it's comical and sad at the same time. I knew I needed that water. It's right there. <clears throat> when sometimes I, I listen to preachers and they try to work out the formula that this is how God works. <laughs> really? You know how I know that? Because I used to do the same thing. See, I preached for a number of years. I don't do it now as much, I, I, at least publicly. <laughs> uh, because what happened was I tried to have a formula on how God works. And people would say, hey, 
this is how God works. If you exhibit this faith, this is what's going to happen. And I look in the scriptures and I realize there's scarcely patterns. God called Abraham, and Abraham literally obeyed and went. He called Gideon, and Gideon says, are you sure you're talking to me? I'm going to test you to see if it's really you. Not once, twice. He called Noah. Um, sorry, he called, uh, yeah, he called Noah. But he also called Jonah. And Jonah says, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and yet God worked powerfully through them. Amen. He called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah says, I need some assurances that you're going to work through me, basically. I say that to say, <coughs> when we try to confine God yeah. to some print on paper, I think we're on the wrong path. Yeah. Are you, do you think I'm saying that the scriptures, we shouldn't be fall? Absolutely. Yeah. But do you think our mighty God can be confined to some print on paper? I want you to think about that. Jesus loved so much and he gathered so much crowd around him that he often was trying to thin the crowds, not gather them. That he was so effective in loving people, the tax collectors, the adulterers, the sinners. <coughs> I ask you a question. If a prostitute were to walk into this room and we knew she was a prostitute, how would we treat her? Somebody doesn't fit a pattern that you think they should fit in. And we have a society that loves to marginalize people, and Christians are the worst at it. Yeah. And we call it, we're, I'm just have firm conviction. You think anybody had deeper conviction than Jesus, and yet he was able to gather all these people so incredibly yeah. mm -hmm. that when the adulterer, <coughs> the woman, she saw him, the prostitute, that she was washing his feet, that she so loved being around Jesus, that the love emanated at such a high intensity. And so we ask, are we loving like Jesus? When was the last time you broke a rule, the, Norman Christ, the normal Christian rule, simply to love somebody and somebody misinterprets? Have you been accused of that recently? Then perhaps are we loving like Jesus? When he raised Lazarus from the dead, it, it was remarkable, ultimately led to him being killed. Let's, let's put some hot buttons. Christians love to marginalize homosexuals. And the very same people are the ones who embrace the adulterers. And we think being drunk is cute. And we think molestation is not as serious. Or sexual assault, oh well, boys will be boys. Man, we don't need some, some closed society in Ottawa. We need to have a society that says, I love you when no one will and no one does. Amen. 
It's not another church we need. There's 335. You think of the, about the math, right? 335,000. 350,000. That's 1,000. Person per church, mathematically. It doesn't take long for someone to know where a church is. Mm -hmm. It's not another one we need. It's that for us to become Jesus is in our community that when someone looks at you and we say, I don't know what it is about you, but man, do I love you. Mm-hmm. But man, do I love you. You know, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I don't know exactly where we're at today. But here's what the scripture says. I'm reading from the NET version. It's, it's a good version that I have been recently reading from. But you can follow along. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, in verse 1, chapter 13, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith that so I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I give over my body in order to boast, <clears throat> but do not have love, I receive no benefit. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious. I'm already guilty. There, oh, so much I'm impatient. Oh, I've been unkind so many times. There, oh yes, there are times I'm envious. Love does not brag. You know what Christians do? We humble brag. Yes. <laughs> And the longer you're a Christian, the better you are at it. (laughs) Yeah, humble brag, you know what that is? I see someone is asking somebody, what is humble brag? Is that when you're bragging and you're trying to not to pretend to be bragging about how you are because you know it's so wrong and yet you want to talk about how great you are when you're talking? (laughs) And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. It is not puffed up. It is not rude. Oh, my. There are so many times, especially to drivers. Has anybody ever driven and somebody says, it was my fault? It never happened. It's always the other person. What an idiot. It is not self-serving. Whoa. It is not easily angered or resentful. It is not easily angered. Man, some of us are hotheads. And some of that us is me. It is not glad about injustice, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It bears all things. Think about that. Believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. This translation reads, love never ends. When I read that translation, it actually gave me an insight because I was so... Pavlov's dog when I read the scriptures but because I knew what it says love never fails right and I always interpret that as a success thing if you want to be successful doing something with someone relationally you need to love them that's not what the scripture says the context of that love never fails the context is a time issue you read it it says prophecy for it's time love never ends so if I love you I will never stop loving you it doesn't matter what you've done to me It never ends. Death does not end love. It never ends. It doesn't matter if you move to another town. Or if you go to another church. (laughs) It never ends.
The context here is not about trying to do something over and over in love and you're going to succeed. No, the context here, it, it's a timing issue. I am such a wretch because they are people who I've stopped loving because in reality it wasn't love. Mm -hmm. I'm so convicted. I now realize when I read about love and talk about the love of Jesus, it's not safe at all. Mm -hmm. It's controversial. It ruffles the feathers. So I ask you, do we want to go to conferences and read books and talk about how we want to, to develop a great church here in Ottawa, or do we really need to learn to love like Jesus? I think if we start doing that, honestly, we're going to have to have people open up the windows. You read it. Jesus loved so much and people were around him so much, he had to thin the crowds. He wasn't, he wasn't scrambling to get someone to come to listen to him. I mean, he was trying to run away from people. <laughs> That's how popular he was. That's how much he loved people. The racial... The gender, the socioeconomic, the education, there were no barriers, there were no cliques. Mm -hmm. Satan's workshop in churches are when cliques develop. And we get camps. We got teen camp, pre-teen <laughs> camp. And then we got all the type of cancer. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like these things wouldn't happen. They're going to happen. But the issue is, what are we going to do about them? And I'm telling you this this morning. It's not because I've figured it out. <laughs> it's that I realize, holy moly, do you need to grow. And a lot of times in my life, I justified so much of what I did in the name <clears throat> of righteousness, and yet only to realize no love is righteousness. And so, you know, I just wanted to provoke your thought this morning. I don't have time to talk about some great... Uh, exegesis and then a lot of things, but I wanted to provoke your thought and whatever you guys as a community, and I love this community, the, decide on what direction you need to go. It at the top of the list needs to be what first, how First Corinthians 13 ends. Look at, what, look at what it says. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. All those are great things, but the greatest of these is love. Guys, if we grow to be a thousand disciples by next year, but have not love, we are nothing. If we grow and we suddenly can hire whoever we want to, but have not love, we are nothing. Nothing. I've asked, my, my life has radically changed in some personal relationships by simply asking a question before I do those things, and I'm going to share it with you. I ask myself in all relationships, before I get with someone, before I talk with someone, what does love require of me? So when I'm talking to my wife and we have a fight, and she's mostly wrong. <clears throat> uh, 
What, what do you say? What? Of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was testing you, Alex. You failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever we, I have to ask myself, what does love require of me in this relationship, in this moment in time? Or when I'm angry at my teenager because they're just a doofus. Because I've never been wrong, of course. <laughs> And I ask myself a question before I go in. It is, what does love require of me? Or when I'm at the grocery store, and I'm someone that doesn't know, how do I encourage this person? What does love require of me? It changed my relationship. That guy who cut me off, what does love require of me? Can you imagine? that we ask that question in every relationship that we have, especially the crucial ones, how do you think those conversations are going to go? Is it all going to be perfect? No, but I, I guarantee you it's going to help. What does love require of me? In our relationships, let's try it for a day. One day. I think there's sometimes you're going to realize, I was going to say this, I need to change my, I need to change what I'm going to say. What, and it doesn't only extend to relationships in the house, at work, at the subway, at the grocery store, at the waiter, at the waitress. Sometimes Christians are the worst abusers of people who serve in that capacity. Let's stop it, please. Let's be like Jesus. And he asked the question, what does this prostitute require of me? What does this Samaritan woman require of me? She needs somebody to talk to her. And show that even though I'm a Jew and I don't even associate. You know, the idea that you don't associate with Jews. The idea there, by the way, is that Jews are not supposed to share the same utensils with someone of a Samaritan. And so he was asking her for what? Water. Whose utensil was he going to use? Hers. Hers. And he, she said, what? Do, do you know who I am? She was so blown away. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to ask me to use my utensils. It's against what you culturally do. rocked her world. She started telling him about her life. Within minutes! You can't break through to someone. Maybe you're not loving them. Maybe it's not all their fault. Or maybe you can help in it. I'll close by this story. Five years ago, my daughter, if you can, Alex, can you turn this off? Thanks. Five years ago,
in this church, who I don't care who becomes the minister in this congregation. It doesn't matter in that sense. You guys are competent enough to figure that one out. Really are. But unless we get this one down straight, we're a clonging symbol. We're a gong. It does not benefit us. And we are nothing. That's not my words. That's the words of Jesus. And so, as I close, hopefully this has at least gotten your mind to think, I don't know what's going on in your life. But whatever relationship you have and whatever you're doing, if you would ask one question, how, what does love require for me in this relationship? I think it will revolutionize the way you treat people and subsequently are treated. And even if you're not treated well, that's not the point here. It's not how we can do something so that benefits us. That's another brand of Christianity, not the one found in the scriptures. Hopefully, these thoughts would have uh, uh, ruffled some feathers and comforted some. That's the, that's the measurement, I think, of a good sermon. It disturbs the comfortable and it comforts the disturbed. Thank you guys so much. I have to run. Let me change that. I have to drive because I'm driving back to Toronto and flying from Toronto. But thank you for having me. More importantly, thank you for listening to me or at least pretending to listen to me. <laughs> and um, I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much.